We're all, we're all awake, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the um, sixth annual, it's hard to believe this is the sixth annual already, um, Everett Ferguson Lecture in Early Christian Studies. And we have another wonderful speaker um, this morning to continue a long line of, of esteemed speakers. And um, this morning, um, Brian Daly is going to be speaking to us. He is the Catherine F. Husking Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, um, a 1961 graduate of Fordham University. He studied ancient history and philosophy at Merton College, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar from 1961 to 1964, and then entered the Society of Jesus. After theological studies in Frankfurt, Germany, and ordination of the priesthood in 1970, he returned to Oxford as a part of the Faculty of Theology from 1972 to 1978. Um, he taught for 18 years at Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts before coming to Notre Dame in 1996. He's the author of many books, including The Hope of the Early Church, which you see over here, um, a book on Gregory of Nazianzus, um, God Visible, Patristic Christology Reconsidered, among others. In the fall of 2012, he was awarded the Ratzinger Prize in Theology by Pope Benedict XVI. He is the first Jesuit and the first American to receive this award. The title of his presentation this morning is Beginning of His Ways, Christ as God's Personified Wisdom in the Early Greek Fathers. Father Davy. Well, thank you, Trevor, and thank you for all for being here. I must say that uh, it's, it's my first trip to, to Lubbock, but it's been a wonderful visit so far. People have been extremely hospitable and kind and showing me all the local sites. And I, I have to say I'm really grateful to be part of this conference of what you do in, in fostering Christian scholarship and the witness that comes from actually studying the tradition. But I'm especially grateful and touched to be giving a lecture that is meant to honor Everett Ferguson, an old friend. I've known Everett from patristic meetings and various kinds of collaboration since I first began teaching more years ago than I should admit. And I always think of him when I read the book of Acts and read about Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Now that title could apply in other languages to Everett Ferguson as well. He is a gracious person, as you know, and somebody who was always incredibly encouraging to younger scholars, to people starting off in the field. I'm sorry he can't be with us this week. I heard from him a few days ago and got a very typically gracious and encouraging email saying go for it. But we're all here really to honor him and to honor his, the great project of scholarship and study that, that he began and still in many ways continues at Abilene. And I know many of you know him and are part of that same legacy, so it's good to be here. Near the beginning of the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul contrasts the criteria of credibility presupposed by religious Jews and philosophically literate Greeks in his day with the shocking simplicity of early apostolic preaching. Jews demand signs, he says, and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1, as you know. The quest for wisdom in ancient Mediterranean society, as Paul realized, was not limited to Greek philosophical speculation. It was, in its broadest terms, a search for the knowledge of the world and oneself that could be put to use in making life better, more predictable, more controllable. It was not necessarily abstract argument, Early in the Phaedo, for instance, Plato has Socrates tell of a frequent dream he had had earlier in life, urging him to cultivate the arts, musiki in Greek. But Socrates says, since the loving pursuit of wisdom is the greatest of the arts, he was convinced by already doing what the voice in his, in his dream commanded. To ask hard questions honestly, to draw on the fruit of long experience in producing the outlines of an art of living and acting well, was for Plato and his forebears the most beautiful of artistic productions. 
Ancient Jewish literature, too, as we know, had its own approach to finding and growing in wisdom. Mainstream Western biblical scholarship since the 19th century, dominated by a narrative that sees the Hebrew Bible as thematically centered on the history of the covenant people, has tended to assume that what we know as wisdom literature in the Bible has historically focused, something less historically focused, more engaged with the wider human aspiration than just the fate and the actions of Israel. People assume that that's generally late and literarily dependent on, on other religious traditions of the ancient Near East. And nevertheless, more recent interpreters, beginning with Gabriel von Rad, with Gerhard von Rad in the 1960s, have argued that the Hebrew tradition of wisdom literature is in fact equally ancient, under the equally ancient as the covenant narrative, expressing in aphoristic form traditional advice for living productively and peacefully in a land whose religious center was the God of the Jerusalem Temple. Although this stream of biblical literature is notoriously difficult to date, von Rad suggested that some classic passages, including chapters 10 to 29 of the book of Proverbs, may well be very old, representing reflections of pre-exilic authors on how members of the Jewish kingdom might learn to cope well with life's challenges. Wisdom like this, most biblical passages agree, is the rarest and most precious of treasures. Some passages in the Hebrew Bible, as von Rad pointed out, quite clearly understand this wisdom to be a kind of intelligible coherence or meaning known to God himself and inscribed in the history and the structure of the world. It also accessible to the human mind that searches for it. Some biblical passages, too, take a slightly different approach, presenting wisdom as a living, dynamic force, occasionally as a growing plant or tree, as in, as in Sirach 24, more often as a person, usually female in gender, that's made by and subject to God, but is living and active in the world, easily discoverable, reaching out graciously to humans, engendering and fostering in those who take the trouble to study her the understanding needed to live well. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, we read in the first century book of Wisdom of Solomon. She's easily discerned by those who love her. She is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate, most public of places. She goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their path and meets them in every thought. Some biblical passages go on to, to identify wisdom particularly with the tradition of Israel. The laws and instructions that Deuteronomy predicted will eventually lead neighboring peoples to be amazed at the nation's inherited store of wisdom. So Sirach again has wisdom comment, the creator of all things gave me a command, and my creator chose the place for my tent. He said, make your dwelling in Jacob. In Israel, receive your inheritance. In the holy tent, the temple, I ministered to him before him. So I was established in Zion. Thus, in the beloved city, he gave me a resting place. And in Jerusalem was my domain. I took root in an honored people, in the portion of the Lord, his heritage. Yet the figure of wisdom is never presented simply as an aspect of Israel's law. She has a wider significance for God's activity in the world, more often seen as the agent of God's creation and other providential ordering of things. Order is a key notion here. The best known instance of this is surely wisdom's lyrical declaration in Proverbs 8, later celebrated by Christian writers by being applied often to Christ. The Lord created me at the, begin at the, at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. Now my children listen to me. Happy are those who keep my ways. Happy is the one who listens to me watching daily at the gates. He who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. A few features of this passage stand out for their shaping influence on the way the figure of wisdom is later understood by both Jews and Christians. She is the first of God's productions, 
She is present in the world with God from the start as a kind of willing assistant in the complex ordering work of creation. God delights in her presence and help, and she in turn delights in his creation, especially in the human race. To learn from her, to keep her ways, brings humans life and blessing. God creates, in other words, through the wisdom that has originally come from him. This wisdom at God's side plays a key role in God's ordering of the non-divine reality as the world, the cosmos, ordered reality. We find our own well-being, we would say we get our act together by seeking out this same friendly, ordering, life-giving wisdom for ourselves. It's perhaps not surprising then that some of the earliest Christian witnesses to faith in Jesus refer to him specifically in similar terms. Jesus taught and worked in Galilee. Some recent New Testament scholars argue less as a prophet or as a messianic figure than as a sage, a wise man and teacher. Although he sometimes spoke in the terms of prophetic warnings or apocalyptic expectation, most of what we have of his teaching, especially in the synoptics, would fall better into the formal categories of biblical wisdom teaching, aphorisms, parables, challenging or puzzling sayings that draw on his hearer's experience of daily life to stimulate further reflection about God's demands and promises. If this was central to how Jesus was remembered, it's perhaps not surprising that some New Testament passages actually refer to him in terms reminiscent of the wisdom tradition of Israel, not only as speaking in the sapiential style, but as being himself the benevolent figure who realizes and reveals God's work. This understanding of Jesus' person as wisdom appears not only in the passage in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which we quoted at the start, where Christ is referred to especially as the power of God and the wisdom of God, but also, I think, in passages like Colossians 1, 15 to 20, or Ephesians 1, 3 to 12, where Christ, Paul and his companions are preaching, is described as the firstborn of all creation, the unifying center of all that is created after him the personal key to understanding God's provident plan to unify and revivify all that he has made. Strikingly, too, Jesus' words to his disciples in Matthew 11 on their return from their first adventure, preaching and working signs in his name, could themselves be spoken, I think, by God's creative nurturing wisdom in Proverbs 8. Jesus says, you remember, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus here, like wisdom, presents himself as a kindly spirit, as inviting those humble enough to listen to be consoled by his revelation of God's light and goodness, and so to become themselves friends of God and prophets. Those are all phrases from the seventh chapter of the Wisdom of Solomon. The disciples of Jesus, thinking of the teaching of Jesus as he presents himself at the end of Matthew 11, could well echo the words of the author of the Wisdom of Solomon. When I enter my house, I shall find rest with her, wisdom, for companionship with her has no bitterness, and life with her has no pain, but gladness and joy. This subtle but pervasive feature of the portrait of Jesus in the New Testament can give us a clearer sense, I think, of why he is so widely referred to in the writings of influential early Christian theologians, not only as the incarnation of the divine logos, God's communicative reason or word, but as himself the wisdom of God. The figure of God's logos, actively present in creation, and the moving force in God's revelation of himself to Israel, has been emphasized strongly by Philo, too, the Jewish philosopher and exegete around the time of Jesus, and is famously echoed, identified with the person of Jesus in the prologue of the Gospel to John, a passage that itself decisively shaped the theological understanding of Jesus in the early church. Understanding Jesus also as God's personified wisdom, as we shall see, was a related but subtly different line of interpretation from identifying him with the Logos, more biblical, less philosophical in its origins, but also an image with different literary resonances. Still, the difference in implications between Christ as divine Logos and Christ as divine wisdom 
seems not to have been immediately apparent to the earliest Christian theologians. Justin, for instance, often styled an early Christian text as the philosopher and martyr. In his first apology, which is usually dated to the early 150s, uses the Johannine characteristic of Je characterization of Jesus as the divine logos made flesh to argue that the object of the Christian's faith and worship is really the same universal reason that shaped the speculations of the classical philosophers. We've been taught, Justin writes, that Christ is the first begotten of God, <clears throat> the prototokon to the U. And I've already testified that he is the reason or logos of which every race of humanity partakes. Those who lived in accordance with reason are Christians, Justin shockingly says, though they were called godless, such as among the Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus. And others like them, or among the barbarians, Abraham, Ananiah, Azariah and Mishael, and Elijah and many others. In his second apology, which may originally have been simply an explanatory appendix to the first one, Justin repeats this assertion, affirming that Christ was and is the reason that is in everyone, who both foretold the things that were to happen through the prophets, and then in his own person, when he became able to experience suffering, as we do, and taught these things. Jesus, in other words, is for Justin's version of this early Logos Christology, the human realization of that same divine universal mind that is active in all reasonable people. In his other major work, The Dialogue with Trypho, which probably comes also from the 150s, Justin argues, now ostensibly at least, with a group of, of critical Jewish rabbis, that Jesus is, in the core of his identity, a unique rational power who proceeds from God the Creator. He writes, God begot as a beginning before all creatures a kind of rational power Dinamin Logikin, from himself, which is called by the Holy Spirit the glory of the Lord, sometimes Son, sometimes Wisdom, sometimes Angel, sometimes God, sometimes Lord, sometimes Logos. And at another time, he calls himself leader of the army when he appears in human form to Joshua, the son of Nun. The word of wisdom who is himself God, begotten from the Father of all things, existing as word and wisdom and power and glory of the one who begot him, bears witness to this through Solomon, when he says, if I declare to you all the things that happen every day, I shall also remind you, remind you how to number the things that are from eternity. The Lord created me as the beginning of his ways for his works. And that's the beginning of the famous passage in Proverbs 8. In the Septuagint reading, I might point out, which is slightly different from the Hebrew one. <clears throat> Here, Justin seems to lay special emphasis on the same passage from Proverbs 8 that would play a central role in later attempts to identify the person of Christ as divine. But he makes no attempt to distinguish the meaning of the divine wisdom as described here from the other terms in the Hebrew Bible that seem to refer to the self-communication or revelatory appearances of the God of Israel. A word, it seems, is a word, even if it's God's word. Perhaps more than the figure of wisdom in Proverbs and other parts of the Hebrew Bible, however, the concept of God's logos suffered from a built-in ambiguity due to the wide range of meanings it can conveyed. In Greek, the term logos could mean, among other possibilities, a word or a unit of language, a story or a narrative, a unit in a larger piece of prose, what in English we usually call a book. It could mean scripture itself, it could mean also the proportion between two measured entities, the intelligible structure or meaning of a thing, and even the faculty of reason itself in which speech and measuring and analysis all abide. Philo's works often refer to a divine logos or rationality discernible in the Hebrew Bible's account of creation and of the election of Israel, and by means of which God has formed the world, revealed himself to the descendants of Abraham, and he continues to be present and to communicate with rational creatures. Philo seems to think of the logos, which he sometimes simply identifies with God's wisdom, as linked to the divine reality at the heart of things, yet also as an agent that is, in some independent sense, operative in the world. When God communicates with humans, Philo understands that it normally happens through God's logos. And so the human experience of God is fundamentally an intellectual vision of the logos as God's image, understood through the ordered universe of sensible, intelligible things that lie, as he says, under the feet of the word that created them. <clears throat> 
This same assumption seems to lie behind language about God's logos in the prologue to John's Gospel and also in the works of Justin. The people argue about how much either the fourth gospel or Justin depend knowingly on the works of Philo. Yet despite the ability of Logos language to link the biblical view of God who creates and calls a people by intelligible speech with the dominant late antique philosophical assumptions of Middle Platonism, it seems to have remained unclear whether Logos language primarily suggested an activity of God or a distinct divine agent. And this in turn raised questions for some early Christian writers, as we'll see, about the ability of Logos language alone to do full justice to the implications of the Bible in referring to Christ. Irenaeus, alone among early Christian theologians, as far as I know, avoids the problem of identifying Logos and wisdom by identifying the Son with the Word of God, but the wisdom mentioned in Proverbs 8 and other places with the Holy Spirit, the Father's other hand, as he puts it, in the creation of the world. Clement of Alexandria, also writing in the last two decades of the second century, emphasizes the role of the Son in realizing and activating the benevolent power of the Father. And so in chapter two of book seven of his Stromates, an extended treatment of God's involvement in all activities of human intelligence, Clement argues that God providentially gave philosophy to the Greeks, as he says, as well as revealing himself and his will to Israel. That's again a quite unique argument, I think, in Clement. Clement tends, however, to look still farther back and to identify the wisdom in which God delighted in Proverbs 8 and elsewhere with the power of God and his most ancient word before the production of all things. God's eternal intelligence, holding within himself all the ideas and forms of things, is always ready to communicate verbally with creatures. It is an origin's work that one first begins to notice a sense of a significant, if subtle, difference between God's word, or logos, and God's wisdom. In the first book of his monumental, unfinished commentary on John, Origen first re reflects on what a gospel is, and why the fourth gospel should be regarded, as he says, as the first fruits of scripture, the gospel of God's gospel, in proclaiming Jesus. The reason is, the work, it's the work of the disciple whom Jesus loved the one who reclined on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. And so it most authentically, most authentically identifies Jesus by one who knows him. Origen sees the main work of proclaiming Jesus as carried out by explaining words or images, epinoiae as he calls them, which scatter throughout the gospel, but especially throughout John, reveal to the thoughtful, meditative reader central defining aspects of Jesus' role in creative history. So the main work he undertakes in book one of the commentary is to reflect on and order the 35 or so titles that are given to Christ in the fourth gospel. Confident that these, that these names or images are the fundamental key to our understanding who Jesus is. If you've ever used his commentary on John, you know that he never gets beyond John 1, 1a in book one of the commentary, which takes about 50 pages in a modern translation. In the beginning was the word. That takes a lot of thought. Um, <laughs> So the first task Origen sees confronting him in explaining Christ's identity here is to explain the gospel's opening phrase, in the beginning was the word. With his characteristic mix of close verbal attention to the biblical text and imaginative exegetical freedom, Origen asks what that archi, that beginning of all created history, must be in which the word, the logos of God, first existed. Because in the beginning was the word. So the word was in something. What was it in? What is the beginning? His carefully crafted answer in chapter 22 of book, the first book of his commentary is to point to Christ's primal identity as wisdom. It is in virtue of his being wisdom, he says, that he is called the archi, the beginning. For wisdom says in Solomon, in other words, in the book of Proverbs, God created me as the beginning of his ways for his works. Septuagint translation. So that the word might be in an archi, namely in wisdom. Considered in relation to the structure, the systesis in Greek, uh, of contemplation and thought about the whole of things is regarded as wisdom. But in relation to the communication of the object of thought with reasonable being, the talogikan, it is regarded as the word. So the structural basis on which God communicates to us is the wisdom in which he speaks his word. <clears throat> 
Origen's point seems to be that while both, while both wisdom and word as fundamental aspects of God's eternal being suggest the divine creative origin of all things as the source of their intelligible identity, wisdom carries with it more the notion of a timeless repository of the divine ideas or forms of things in themselves, while word suggests the divine act of communicating these forms outwards. The parallels of the Middle Platonic understanding of creation as the work of a divine agent or second god in the Timaeus, especially, who contains within himself as divine mind the intelligible principles of all things and employs them in the formation of an ordered world, a cosmos, seems clear. But here in origin, the conception is used to go further and to interpret scripture. He continues, for I consider that as a house or a ship is built or fashioned in accordance with the sketches of the builder or the designer, while the house and the ship have their beginning, their archi, in the sketches, the tipus and reckoning, logos, inside the builder himself. So all things came into being in accordance with the structures, the logos of things that were to exist and previously defined by, defined by God in his wisdom. For in wisdom he made all things. The word by which God creates all things, which he speaks in Genesis 1.1, thus becomes a kind of ex executor for the plans of God that exist with a view to creation in the eternal treasury, which is God's wisdom. But Origen takes pains to emphasize a few chapters further on in book one of the commentary on John, that in God, this all-containing wisdom is not simply a mental function or activity of God, but has a concrete, if wholly spiritual, existence in itself alongside the Father, as the Bible suggests. He writes, for the wisdom of God, of the God and Father of all things, does not have his concrete existence, his hypostasis is the word that he uses, in mere imagination, like the mental images analogous to our human thoughts. But if someone is able to think of a bodiless individual existence, living and as it were vivified by the various ideas that express the intelligible structures of all things, that person will know the wisdom of God that is above all creation, that beautifully says of itself, God created me as the beginning of his ways for his works. God's wisdom for origin is a hypostasis then, a concrete individual whom God has produced specifically to be the living mind that then expresses itself actively as God's creative revealing word. Later in book 19 of this commentary, Origen suggests that this hypostasis, who is the Son and Christ, and who as wisdom contains the principles of intelligibility for all creation, can himself be thought of as a cosmos, an ordered world. He writes, you may wonder whether in some way, according to our discussion, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15, could be called a world, especially in that he is wisdom in all its diversity. For because of the fact that principles, logos of everything whatsoever, according to which everything created in wisdom by God has come into being in him, for the prophet says, David, you have made all things in wisdom, he himself would be wisdom, so much more varied than the perceptible world, differing from it so much as the rational structure of the logos of the whole world, free of all matter, differs from the material world. Since it is ordered not by matter, but by participating in the rational principle of wisdom that gave matter its order. And again, you see a kind of platonic approach to thinking about the relationship of intelligibility and materiality, which is still essentially for him a biblical interpretation. In his work on first principles, apparently written to outline the basic assumptions of Christian biblical interpretation around 230 or 231, after he had begun the commentary on John, Origen also stresses that the wisdom of God referred to in the Bible is not just a quality of God, but a hypostasis, although without bodily characteristics. And yet if God is eternal and eternally wise, his hypostatized wisdom must always have been with him carrying out his work of planning and forming a created world. Wisdom, therefore, he writes, must be believed to have been begotten beyond the limits of any beginning that we can speak of or understand. And because in this very subsistence, this hypostasis of wisdom, there was implicit every capacity and form of the creation that was to be, the form both of these things that exist in a primary sense and of those which happen in consequence of them, the whole being fashioned and arranged beforehand by the power of foreknowledge. Wisdom, speaking through Solomon in regard to these very created things that had been, as it were, outlined and prefigured in herself, says that she was created as the beginning of his ways, 
which means that she contains within herself both the beginnings and the causes and species of the whole creation. Later on in book four of the same work, Arjuna will emphasize that the wisdom of God always remains inexhaustible to the human mind. Quote, for however far one may advance in the search and may progress through an increasingly earnest study, even when aided and enlightened in mind by God's grace, that person will never be able to reach the final goal of his inquiries. Even though God's wisdom is oriented towards the created world, it remains God's and is not part of creation. Some years later, in the mid-240s, Arjun wrote his great apologetic work against the Middle Platonist philosopher Kelsus, who had sharply criticized the Christians as religiously ignorant and unsophisticated. And here, in the course of defending the Christian focus on worshiping the transcendent creator alone, Arjun remarks, for we ought not to imagine that because they are feminine nouns, wisdom and righteousness are feminine in their being. In our view, the Son of God is these things as his genuine disciple showed when he said of him, who has made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, 1 Corinthians 1. Therefore, though we may call him a second God, it should be understood by this that we do not mean anything but the virtue, the arete, which includes all virtue, and the logos, which includes every logos whatsoever, of the beings which have been made according to the nature. We say that this logos dwelt in the soul of Jesus and was united with him in a closer union than that of any other soul, because he alone had been able perfectly to receive the highest participation in him who was the Logos itself, and wisdom itself, and righteousness itself. So participation is taken here as the way of explaining this union. In these and numerous other passages, Origen draws on the biblical figure of God's creative wisdom as a way of reflecting more deeply on the uniquely divine identity of Jesus. The Son is, as John's prologue affirms, the eternal creative word of God, who in God's plan came unto his own by being made flesh and dwelling among us. Yet that word of creation and revelation is also God's eternal wisdom, present at God's side, as Proverbs 8 picturesquely asserts, throughout God's work, residing in the midst of God's people, delight delighting to be among them and clarifying for them the virtues and practices that draw an ordered world closer to God. Some modern scholars have suggested that Origen, a contemporary of the mainly Western Monarchian controversy in the early third century that we find in writers like Tertullian, considers divine wisdom as even more primordial than the divine word because the term suggests a more stable, enduring, hypostatic presence, both with God and in the world, that, and so it avoids the possibly modalist interpretation, implications of word language, which might suggest the Logos is simply God's passing activity by pointing to the figure of divine wisdom who was always there at God's side. Whether or not this was really a concern for Origen, he clearly sees the late Hebrew conception of wisdom as an explanation for how the intelligible structures of the world are contained and rooted in God, ready to be used by God in the formation of a cosmos outside himself, not just as forms to be mirrored, but as the possessions of a creative mind involved in the process from the start. In the early fourth century, the tradition of drawing on the wisdom figure of the Hebrew Bible took on a new importance in the controversy over Arius' Christology. That outspoken presbyter had insisted, as we know, that Christ is above all mediator between an essentially unknowable, transcendent God and the world of finite creatures. Himself created from nothing by the Father, Arius would argue, but not created as one of the creatures, he adds to be God's agent in both the rest of the act of creating and in the redemption of fallen creatures. The Logos, or the, the Son, is in some way a created, mediating figure. Arius' interpretation seems to reflect a wider habit of early fourth century thinking, possibly inspired by Origen's wisdom Christology, some have suggested that, that stressed the hypostatic act of independence of the word and that also saw the origin of the word's being and activity in God's creative act. Eusebius of Caesarea, for example, the devoted leader of the Origenist school of exegesis and theological speculation, 50 years after Origen's death, struggles to explain the relationship of God, the Son, as divine wisdom uh, to the Father, concluding that as one of the most unexplained and inconceivable aspects of Scripture's mysteries. In reflecting on Proverbs 8 as one of the key biblical sources dealing with the origin of the Son in his work, The Proof of the Gospel, 
Eusebius insists that the coming to be of the hypostasis wisdom cannot be compared with the generation of animal offspring as we know it, or with the separation and independent launching of what was originally simply an aspect of the Father's unique being. For the Son was certainly not unbegotten for age infinite, he writes, and without beginning within the Father as one thing within another that differs from itself as being a part of him which afterwards is changed and cast out from him. For such a being would be subject to change. But it is equally dangerous to take the opposite road and say this without qualification, that the Son is begotten of things that were not, similar to the other human begotten beings. For the generation of the Son differs from creation through the Son. So you see, he doesn't want to say that the Son is created from nothing, but he also wants, doesn't want to say that it's kind of a, a natural extrusion of uh, what is part of God originally. Eusebius did not understand the Son simply as a part of God then, but also refuses to follow Arius' path. He also resists the modalist solution of comparing the Son's relationship to the Father to that of fragrance coming out of an aromatic ointment or a ray of light coming from its source. The Word of God has its own essence and existence by itself, he says. Eusebius opts for an understanding of the Son as a living image of the Father, subsequent and dependent in his being, but not formed in a material way not an icon. For it neither was he brought into being from the unbegotten being by way of any event or by division, nor was he eternally existent with the Father. And since the one is unbegotten and the other begotten, the one is Father and the other is Son, and all would agree that a Father must exist before and, and, exist before and precede his Son. And thus the image of God would be a kind of living image from the living God in a mode that is beyond our words and reasoning, existing in itself immaterially and unembodied and unmixed with anything opposite to itself, but not such an image as we connote by the term, which differs in its essential substance and its species, but one rather which in itself contains the whole of the species and is like in its own essence to the Father. That's a pretty complicated and subtle explanation, right? Eusebius is laboring hard here to describe the Son as genuinely both divine and derived, not co-eternal with the Father, but also not made out of nothing, as worldly creatures all are. Arius' challenge for, forced Christian preachers and leaders to move a step farther and take a stand in the name of the Church's faith on the divinity of the Son of God. The classic expression of this, of course, one that remained controversial for some 50 years, driving theological debate through most of the fourth century, was the creed formulated by the Council of Nicaea in 325, affirming, as it says, that the only Son of God, encountered historically as Jesus, was generated from the Father, that is, from the essence of the Father, the usia of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same substance, homoousion, with the Father, through whom all things came to be. This undisguised affirmation that the Son, the divine wisdom, the Word who became flesh, is God in the same sense, is homoousios, belongs to the same eternal substance as the one God confessed in the Bible, was the Council's real challenge to Arius, and even to the more nuanced position of Eusebius, who could not move beyond saying the Son and the Father, whose image he, whose image he is, are like in essence. The strongest defense of the Nicene position, as things turn out, <clears throat> came from Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, from 328 through five periods of exile until his death in 373. In his longest anti-Arian polemic, the three orations against the Arians, probably composed during the, his Roman exile in the 340s, Athanasius deals at length with some 15 biblical texts that have been used in argument by all sides in the current debate about Christ. His most extended discussion towards the end of his second oration deals with the now famous meditation on divine wisdom in Proverbs 8, especially with the affirmation of wisdom in Proverbs 8.22, the Lord created me as a beginning of his ways for his works. Here in the midst of the controversy over Arius' Christology, the central point at issue has become wisdom's claim in this text that she is created to do the Lord's work. And you can see how that text might be read in a somewhat different way from the way Origen did by people like Arius and his disciples. If wisdom here is identified as the Christian tradition since Paul had identified it with Christ the Son in his pre-incarnate existence, 
Then Proverbs 8.22 seems to support Arius' claim that the Son is, first of all, a creature, first of creatures, formed by God from nothing else in order to be the first of his ways, the instrument of God's further creating and his saving work. But he's not presented there as a transcendent or eternal being, as the Father is, Arius would argue. Athanasius begins his response by insisting that creation in his full sense of the formation of something from nothing is clearly a work that can be done by God alone. So if God's wisdom is himself a creature from nothing, however exalted his assigned work is in history, he himself would have to be created. He would be engaged in reshaping what is already created and will still need another mediator to have created him. There may have been, or there have been many mediators between God and humanity in history, Athanasius argues. The angels, the apostle, for example, or Moses and Aaron. If then he were a creature and one of the things that have come to be, then there must have been many such sons so that God might have many such ministers. But if this is not possible to see as, right, as being right, but if while there are many creatures, the word is one, Anyone will conclude from this that the Son differs from them all and is not on a level with the creatures, but is proper, or idios, to the Father. In fact, Athanasius goes on, God creates not through a created mediator, but simply by God's own will, speaking out the word that is always within him and proper to him. The crux of this difficult verse in Proverbs 8, Athanasius realizes, is the meaning of the phrase, God created me in his, in, for his works. The interp his interpretation begins from the assumption that the text refers not to the identity of the divine wisdom itself, but to wisdom's role in the economy, in the person of Jesus. In this passage, he writes, it is not as signifying the essence of the Godhead, nor his own everlasting and genuine generation from the Father that the Word has spoken through Solomon, but rather his human economy directed towards us. As I have said before, he has not said, I am a creature, or I became a creature, but only he created. This mere term, he created, does not necessarily signify the essence or the generation of the Son. It indicates something else as coming to be in him, of whom it, is, uh, of whom it speaks. Not simply that he who is said to be created is at once in his nature and essence a creature. God created me at the beginning of his ways for his works. The passage in Proverbs, then, is for Athanasius really an affirmation that the created aspect of God's wisdom as the beginning of his ways for his works, what wisdom will undertake for the sake of fallen creatures, is a created humanity that now belongs to God's own word and wisdom in order to transform the human creature from within. So he continues, for the Lord, the Lord, knowing his own essence to be that of the only begotten wisdom and offspring of the Father, other than things that have come to be, natural creatures, says in love to humanity, the Lord created me as the beginning of his ways. As if to say, my father has prepared for me, has created for me a body for human beings on behalf of their salvation. So we must not conceive that the whole word is in nature a creature, but that he put on a created body, and that God created him, made him a body for our sakes, preparing for him the created body as is written for us, that in him we might be capable of being renewed and deified. The whole shape of the interpretation of the phrase is turned now to the incarnation itself. He was eternally begotten as son and word and wisdom, Athanasius is arguing, receives a human created nature, becomes himself a creature, so that the human creature might come to be a child of God in the new creation. Our renewal in Christ is founded in God's eternal wisdom, which that reveals to us in its incarnation as truly the beginning of his ways which is our salvation. A speculation on the figure of the divine wisdom in the Hebrew Bible by early Greek theologians as a way of identifying the person and work of Christ was, as even these brief reflections suggest, an increasingly important scriptural means of reflecting on his role at bringing God's saving work in history, God's ways, to their climax and fulfillment. Is it possible, one might ask, to see some coherent direction in the ways early Christian writers drew on the biblical picture of the divine wisdom to understand Jesus? We can only say a few things, at least. First, late Jewish reflection on God's work in the world, creating it from nothing, revealing himself in the midst of space and time, calling a people, entering into a covenant with them, seems increasingly to have evoked a sense that God's radical, mysterious unity could be expressed in a plurality of agents that engage with creatures for their good. 
the personal self-presentation of divine wisdom in Proverbs 8 and 9, in the Wisdom of Solomon 6 to 8, and in Sirach 24, among other passages, seems to lay the foundation for Philo's reflection on the divine logos, what we, might, what we might call God's utterable intelligence as God's regular agent in creation for doing his will. The portrait of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels and the Logos theology of John, along with phrases in the Pauline Corpus, show traces of an early Christian conviction that Jesus could preach and act as he did because he was himself the realization of God's healing, enlightening wisdom. Second, in the Christian theological literature of the second and third centuries, this increasing use of this interpretive theme was not long in coming. Justin recognizes the titles of the divine logos and divine wisdom as two of the principal biblical titles realized in Jesus, enabling Christian believers to identify him as the fulfillment of God's historical plan of salvation. Clement of Alexandria sees the communication of wisdom to the human race as one of God's most constant blessings, brought to his fullness in Christ. Origen, a generation later, argues at some length that the wisdom is the original title or concept, the original epinoia, given in scripture to identify Jesus and his work. Like Justin and Clement, Origen draws on the Middle Platonist conception of a divine mind containing the whole realm of intelligible, communicable ideas, all of which play a key role in forming an ordered, regular cosmos or world, a world where speech and thought are key to our well-being. Unlike the Platonic world of ideas, these ideas are dynamically ordered to the development and perfection of things in history because they form the mind of God's agent in creation and salvation, divine wisdom, the Son, the Word who became flesh, Jesus. Third, in the fourth century controversy over the identity and precise role of wisdom, much of the debate was centered on the tradition of identifying him as the divine wisdom. For Arius, and to a lesser extent for Eusebius of Caesarea, identifying Jesus as the divine wisdom implied he was less than God in the full transcendent sense, but still the agent or mediator who was formed in God's image. For Athanasius, on the contrary, Jesus, Jesus could only do God's work if he were himself fully and eternally divine. Proverbs 8.22, he argued, must be interpreted as referring not simply to the identity of divine wisdom as created, but to his role in the economy of salvation as wisdom and fleshed. Apollinarius of Laodicea, interestingly enough, who claimed to be a disciple of Athanasius, even insists in one fragment that Christ must be the divine wisdom itself, hypostatic, but now enfleshed, if he is not just to be identified with the wisdom that enlightens any human mind. For Apollinarius to be a key to Jesus' identity, divine wisdom must take the place of a created mind in Jesus. It's not, not a path that the church chose to follow. In these early reflections, fourth, on Jesus as divine wisdom, one sees an important line of thought that would lead in the context of an increasing controversy, and especially in the work of the three Cappadocian fathers, to the formal articulation of the divine, distinctively Christian understanding of God as Trinity, a trinity of related persons or hypostases, all of whom act together to create and save, and who share radically single, ultimately unknowable divine nature or substance. This Trinitarian understanding of God was not meant as an explanation, I would argue, but a way of drawing together into a single conceptual model, unique in itself, the conviction about who and what the saving, revealing God of the Bible is. It is also a major step towards the debates and reflection in the next century on who Jesus the Savior is in himself that precipitated the fifth, sixth, and seventh uh, that preoccupied the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries, and indeed has led to the continuing development of the whole breadth of our Christian reflection. In Christ, after all, as Paul reminds the Colossians, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, a fullness that still beckons us to delight in God's own wisdom and to walk in his ways. Thank you very much. Right.
get in it was the first time I lived my life. You can read all of them. I'm trying to see if you can talk about that in relationship to your book book that's on top of you. Well, you know, it is a, a typical early Christian conception, I think, but probably rooted in the more widespread Greek philosophical understanding of history, of time, that the way we hope and believe things will eventually be in their fullness and perfection will mirror and bring to fulfillment what is always as part of God's being and God's creation. Which doesn't necessarily mean that we simply live in a cycle and go back to where we were at the start. I mean, some people have interpreted that Way, but I think that there really is more a sense of, of consistency in what God does outside God's self. So that the goal to which God calls creatures and for which he's made us is really a, a realization of the kind of unity and diversity within that unity which one can hypothesize at least was, was present in the very beginning of things. And so uh, a lot of the development of Trinitarian thought and of a kind of philosophy of history does uh, move in that direction. You know, some uh, you know, say that Origen, who speaks about a pre-existence of beings in some sense before the creation of the material world, was the founder of this way of thinking. There's debate as to exactly how Origen understands that pre-existence. Is the world we live in the result of the fall? It's simply a kind of less desirable state that we brought about by turning away from God. That seems to be the meaning of some passages, but others are much more subtle on this. I think. But to say that in, either by foreknowledge or by plan, God designs a, a history, a, a pro, an economy that overcomes sin and human misuse of, of freedom to reunify and to communicate life, um, it does seem to be very much part of the way Arjun thought and the way Gregory of Nyssa thought more explicitly. And so we have this tradition in the early church of what's called apokatasis, the restoration of all things, a word that appears in Acts 3, I think, um, to um, signify that God will bring creation in, at the end of time back to the original plan in a greater fullness than we've ever experienced. Um, and with that, it's connected to the idea of universal salvation, um, unwillingness to think that any of God's creatures could be lost in the process. But this, as you know, is, is something that Christians still debate about and argue about, and not necessarily made explicit, I think, in most of the early fathers. You'll find it more in Gregory of Nyssa and in sixth century people than you do in Origen, I think, but there's a lot of debate what Origen really said and what he really meant, so. But I hope that does something to pick up your question anyway. I realize there's a lot to throw at you at 9 o'clock in the morning, but... Uh, <laughs> say that we really have to say the Son of God died on the cross, which scandalized all kinds of people. 
the one that he died in, in his humanity, but some of God didn't die. But if the subject of this passion is truly the Son of God, the Word made flesh, then in some sense we have to affirm that, which is scandalous and bothers our minds. And, and uh, we still struggle with how we think of it. Okay. Um, yes. In following this kind of pattern of, of logos and Sophia and so forth through through all, uh, through this period, and uh, with its exegetical quality, like that you were talking about with origin and so forth, th there's a, a pattern that, that doesn't use that language, such as Philippians two, um, you know, five through eleven, the famous uh, hymn there that doesn't use Logos or Sophia, but does end up with Jesus Messiah is Kurios, who is that which is the name of God throughout the Septuagint. Uh, how does that interact with those things and play a role in relationship to them? Or do they deal with those in the same context well, in, the, in this line of, of, of development? It's interesting, last night, I just finished on the way here. I'm playing, reading a thesis uh, that one of our, our graduate students wrote uh, on the exegesis of Philippians 2, 5 through 11 in Greek uh, patristic literature up to Cyril of Alexander. And it, it becomes more and more a very central text that people draw on. They, they argue, how can we say that he who was, you know, the Son of God did not cling to this as hot pot moss, that's what we're trying to write about, but emptied himself, taking on the nature of a slave. And to me, the great mystery, what does it mean that the Son of God emptied himself of, of what? And what does that mean? That he stopped being God or that he empties himself of the honor and prestige of being God? Or what is it that he emptied and poured out? Or, and some of the early writers, like Origen again, will say, no, it's more like if you empty a flask of perfume, you pour it out on the table, the whole house smells of the perfume. That, it means distributes himself, gives himself away, which maybe is more attractive than that he emptied himself for our sakes. But anyway, he's humbled unto death, and then was raised by the Father, exalted. And so all creation, I can see who this is, and say, Jesus Christ is curious. Uh, I, I don't think it's a, a different idea, really, as the, the wisdom one, but it stresses the kind of trajectory of the incarnation. That he who is God, eternally in a sense, uh, takes on a temporal existence which involves humiliation. And in entering into time, in that sense, undergoes change. And that's what saves us. That, that the idea, though, that, that you end there with, of the, that the kurios is name, and the name is the name of God all through the, the scripture. And so that it points to a, a kind of level of identity that is beyond even Sophia. You know? Right. But conferring a name could be, you know, saying, come and sit with me. I mean, a, a kind of transactional. And that's how. Uh, and that would pair better with the idea that he didn't consider this status that he had from eternity something to hang on to, mm. but was willing to let go of it in humility, and therefore now is publicly acknowledged. And every, all, even the people under the earth can see this is uh, Jesus Christ and Lord. But it, it's a, a different kind of image being implied, I think, to say the unsayable, yeah. <laughs> which is who Jesus is. Yes, back to the corner. So you spoke about how, as time goes on, we see more distinguishing between the titles of word and wisdom for Christ. Um, as that distinguishing happens, would you say that word becomes more strongly associated with the economy of, of the Son and his action in creation and his salvific action more particularly? Well, I think that's right. I mean, I often wonder what, why are these two titles seen as particularly different from each other? But it seems that for people, in antiquity, at least, the notion of logos has something active about it, communicative about it. I mean, it also means reason and structure, it means everything. But as Philo reads it in the Bible, it means God speaking at his time, creating, you know, in Genesis 1 1 and so on, commanding that things happen. And that's obviously central to what people see in Jesus. But to say, an origin will say that wisdom is even more primordial as a notion is to say that Jesus isn't simply a passing act of God or a thing that begins in time. Well, he is that. But Jesus is the, all there at God's side. God delights in Jesus, creates through him, calls people, participating, and then eventually speaks him out 
as, as the word. So he, the wisdom of God is the beginning in which the word was, which may seem kind of contrived to us, but it's the way Arshad thinks. And it's very literal, it's saying I'm very philosophical. And I have to say that wisdom is even more primordial, is to say that the identity of Jesus is not just to be read in the economy, not just, um, you know, there's something that helps us to understand how God loves us. But Jesus is really part of the mystery of God who is not separated, but is distinguished from the Father and prays to as an Holy Spirit who he gives to us. And the, the notion of the Trinity is that it was not an explanation, but it was an affirmation of really is trying to pull together these funny things that we say about the mystery of God. Hmm. Um, and they don't get that to that till the time of the Cappadocian and 375 to 80, but it kind of gradually filters in on as, as the way we think about what's going on in the personal life. Other questions? Her Bella, you got to have coffee. <laughs> 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 well, if there are no further questions, let's thank Father Daly again.